Let's talk about GCC calling conventions. So in GCC, what happens uh, to use of the stack is the um, so what happens is the arguments from the previous function, the function to call this function, are pushed on the stack, and then it makes a call. So basically, what happens is there is a push. So this is from the previous function, push arg two. push arg1, and then call whatever the current function is. Okay, when you, call a, when you call a function, that will push the current instruction pointer, or actually rather the instruction pointer to which you're going to be returning, so the one after the call instruction, onto the stack. So that's this return EIP. And this double line here shows that the, uh, that's sort of the difference from one stack frame to the next stack frame. Okay, so then we have a saved EBP, which is our frame pointer, and the EBP will point to that saved EBP. Okay, and then we have local variables or saved registers that the current function is going to use. And the stack pointer is going to point to the bottom most. Well, let's say the topmost entry on the stack, which is at the lowest um, address in memory since the stack grows down. So what's important to note is from the EBP, the arguments are at a specific location from the EBP, positive from the EBP. So you can see the saved EBP is at zero of EBP, the return instruction pointer is at 4, and then the first argument is 8, and then uh, 12, and so on, in decimal. The other thing to note is that these EBPs form a chain of the call stack. So if we've got three functions, let's say the prev, uh, well, let's actually say prev minus 2, Prev minus one and current. And what we're looking at here are the stack frames for each. So the stack frames for current, the stack frames for prev minus one, and the stack frames for prev minus two. So in current, stack frame will be any of our local variables. In the prev minus one stack frame will be the parameters that would pass to current. In prev minus two stack frame will be the parameters that pass to prev one. But what we also have then is that the EBP is going to point to here. And that then is going to point to the previous one. And that's going to point to the previous one and so on. Why do we care about this? In C, we don't care. Okay, Because in C, we can't access the parameters or local variables. Well, we can't access any but our own parameters and our own local variables. So we can't go in and access the local variables of pre-1 or pre-2 and so on. But in other languages, like, like Python, we can, for instance. Uh, so that is a reason why we have this... Uh, um, chain of EPPs. So there's a contract, so to speak, between callers and callees. Okay, they have to, they, one function, when it calls another function, they both have to agree on, for instance, where the parameters will be, the order of the parameters, where return results will get returned, and so on. So this is the contract that's used by GCC uh, for x86. So first off, we have, so just after the call, EIP points to the first instruction of the function. Right? That kind of makes sense. We're calling the function, so the instruction pointer is pointing at the, the first uh, instruction. Second, the stack pointer plus four points at the first argument. Okay. So the stack pointer itself is pointing at what? Well, it's pointing at the saved instruction pointer. And that's what we show here. The stack pointer points at the return address. 
Okay, so that's how you enter. At exit, EIP contains the return address. Well, that of course makes sense. That's how we're going to start executing uh, the after the return of the call. Second, ESP points at the arguments pushed by the caller. Now that's something that could be done differently. And in fact, in other languages and other systems, it has been done differently. So you can imagine, uh, you could say, well, if I have a call to foo of ABC at one point in my program and a call of foo of XYZ at another part of the program, why should the caller here, caller here clearly is going to have to push A, B, and C. Right? And that's certainly also an, an, another question is what is the order uh, that they're pushed? And so the parameters are pushed right to left. But in any case, so we have at one point of our program, let's say a, a part A, and then some, some function B. So uh, in A, we call foo of ABC. We, so we push C, we push B, we push A, we call foo. Why not go ahead and have foo pop off C, B, and A? Okay, Because when we call foo of X, Y, Z, we're going to also have to push C, push Y, push X, and then again, pop off the parameters. So wouldn't it be simpler for the callee to pop the parameters? And we don't do that in C, and we don't do that for GCC, and the reason is we can have variable numbers of parameters. So it can be very difficult for Foo to know exactly how many parameters were pushed. It's much easier to just say, hey, let's go ahead and have the caller pop off the same number of parameters that they pushed. So at our exit, again, EIP contains the return address, ESP points at the arguments, so therefore, this can look something like push C, push B, push A, call foo, and then uh, pop, pop, pop. Or instead of pop, just go ahead and actually adjust the stack pointer to move over, because there's no reason to have three instructions when, when one would work. The called function might have trashed the arguments. Okay, so that's worth knowing is that the called function has the right to change the elements on the stack. Okay. The return value, right? And see, we have a single return value. Where is it? It's in the EAX register. Okay, and, and if it was a 64 bit value, which it normally is, and it also use the EDX register. So therefore, the EX register uh, may be trashed. In fact, it is. That's going to be the return result. The DX and the CX also may be trashed. So those are considered scratch registers. That, so they are not maintained over a call boundary. So if I call foo, the after the call to foo, the values of the Ds and the C registers may be different from what they were before. Uh, on the other hand, uh, let's say BP, BX, ESI, EDI are all values that they had as of the call. So if the callee needs to use any of those registers, it's the callee's responsibility to save them, presumably, on the stack before modifying them. And I mentioned that the parameters are pushed right to left. The reason for that is, again, for a variable number of arguments. Let's say, for example, we have a call to printf. Uh, Okay, so we're calling printf and we're passing a format specifier as we normally do that's going to have two parameters in it, so percent %d and a percent %s. So we're basically going to print out three and going to print out hello. So the parameters that are pushed onto the stack are going to be first a pointer to hello and then the three, and then a pointer to the format specifier, 
and then we're going to actually uh, make the call. But these are the parameters that will be on. So we'll have three parameters. The calling routine needs the format specifier in order to figure out how many other arguments there are. So printf is actually going to look back based on either the stack pointer uh, or the original stack pointer and can go back and look and see where the parameters are. So the format specifier needs to be at a well-known location. Right? If the order of these were switched, how would printf know where to find the format specifier? Right? So instead, we see the format specifiers first on the stack, which means it's the last one that's pushed. And since the format specifier occurs first in the parameter list, that means it's the last to be pushed. So we push from right to left, we get the format specifier, then printf can go ahead and use the format specifier, and as it finds any percent formats, go and pull successive arguments from the parameter list. And then it's up to the caller to printf to pop the right number of arguments. All right, so let's look at some actual code that gets generated by some functions. All right, so we have three functions, main, f, and g. And they're fairly simple. My, so main calls f, f calls g, and g just does some computation. So let's look first at main. So in main, we have a prologue. So this is just a comment. What are we going to do? Well, the first thing we're going to do is push ebp, right? Because ebp is our frame uh, pointer. And so we go ahead and save the current value. Okay. Then we have the body of the code. The body of the code is just the return f of 8 plus 1. So how are we going to do that? We're going to call f. So first we push 8 and then call f. And then, in fact, let's go ahead and look at the stack as we're doing this, okay? So on the stack, well, one question might be who's calling main, and we'll have to get to that later, but there's, there's some code that has to have actually called main, uh, set up the stack, and so on. But let's look here. We're going to have the old ebp and our current ebp will point to there. Okay, our stack pointer is now pointing to here. We're then going to go ahead uh, and push, sorry, and what's above the old ebp is the old eip, so the return address. Now what are we going to do? We're going to push 8. And then we're going to make a call to f. So our old instruction pointer, so the return address of the instruction pointer, well, let's kind of put that to right here, right? Because this is where we want to return to, so after the call. So once the call is complete to f, then this will no longer be on the stack. We'll return back to the add. We'll add one to EAX. EAX is a return result of F. And then EAX will now be one more than it was. And then we can go ahead and move EBP into the stack pointer. So that will basically pop this off. So now the stack will be pointing where EBP points. Then we'll pop off the EBP. And this will be left in the stack and then we'll return. Now let's continue on looking at the stack as we enter f. So what does f do? f does the same thing. It has the same prologue, right? So we push evp. So this is going to be pointing to the old evp. And now evp is going to be pointing at our new Right there. Right. And then we are going to, uh, so we push the EBP, we move the stack point of the EBP, great. Now we're going to push 8 of EBP. What the heck is 8 of EBP? Well, here's EBP. 0 of EBP is our old frame pointer, right back to the old frame. 4 of EBP is the return address. 
to which we'll be returning, and 8 of EBP is the first parameter. Okay, so that's the first parameter. So we're going to take that and push it. Why are we pushing it? Well, because we're calling g with x. So where do we get x? From that first parameter, and then we push it on. So we push on an 8. Then what do we do? Well, then we call g. Okay, here. So what happens when we call g? We've got the old, oh, we're sorry, we've got the return address. So that's going to be here. And now we're in G. Okay, so G uh, can do the same thing, right? Push the EBP. Update the EBP. And then go ahead and what else we'll do? It's going to push ebx. So it's got the old ebx. Why does that have the old ebx? Well, because ebx is one of these call e saved registers. So it can't be trashed when you return. However, this function wants to use ebx. So therefore, it's got to save it before it messes with it. Okay. And then we're going to move 8 of EBP, so again, EBP, well, in fact, here we go. 8 of EBP is the first parameter, so that's this 8. We're going to move that into EBX, add 3 into it, and then move EBX into e EAX. Could it have just done this directly in EAX? Yes, okay, but it didn't. Um, so it's now trashed EBX, and EAX has the correct result, which will be 11. So... EAX is 11, EBX is now 11. What do we do? We now restore EBX. Okay, so this was a callee saved register. The callee did save it on the stack. Now we need to get rid of it. So we'll go ahead and this is the old value. It was popped, so this is no longer on the stack. And now we move EBP to ESP. Right, so that causes the stack pointer to move to here, and then we pop EBP, and then we return. So the return will remove the instruction pointer. EBP is back to here. And now we're back in F. Again, we move EBP to the stack pointer. So what's that going to do? That's going to basically pop the parameters to that we passed to G. So if we'd had, we just pushed one parameter this time, but even if we push 10 parameters, still when we move EBP into ESP, that'll jump ESP up to here. So I'll basically remove this from the stack. And then what do we do? Then we pop EBP. So EBP is now this old value. We popped it, so we're no longer on the stack. What's on the top of the stack now? Again, lowest memory address, top of stack, is our return address. So we go ahead and do the return and come back to the uh, add one. So now, We add 1 to EAX, so EAX is now 12. Uh, what else do we do? We then go ahead and again, move EBP DSP, that is pop the parameters. And then we go ahead and pop EBP. So EBP now has its old value. And then we return back to whoever called us. And we return with whatever called us, what's our result? In EAX, which is 12. Okay. Main functions in C can have a return result. Those are actually 
become the result of the process because the process finishes when we leave main and processes on Unix have a status, which is an integer, that's going to be 12. Okay, we'll, we'll look into that as we get into the shell and look at, at status codes. So that gives us an example of how the stack is used for main, f, and g, and the code we can see that's, that's using each of these. Now, there is an optimization that we can do, okay, and that compiler can do. In particular, if the compiler knows we have a leaf function, that is a leaf function is a function that doesn't call any other functions, so g certainly uh, is a leaf function, then what we can do is optimize g for space. How can we optimize g? Well, what we can say is we don't need the frame pointer because we know we're not calling any other functions. So forget about the frame pointer. Just leave it alone. And as you can see, it just turns into these three instructions, which is basically move four VSP. Okay, why four and not eight? Because we didn't bother pushing the old uh, uh, EBP. And then this also is saving space because it's not bothering to use the EBX register. So in some sense, that's a little unfair because it sure seems as though this code could have chosen to not use the EBX register, and that would have saved us some code as well. We wouldn't need to push EBX. We wouldn't need the pop EBX, so it would have been a little simpler. But in any case, so 4 of ESP, again, ESP points at the return address, so 4 of ESP is the first parameter. Put that into EX, add 3 to it, and return. So that's, that's uh, certainly simpler. We've got, instead of 10 instructions, we've got only three instructions. So that should run about three times as fast. So that is GCC calling conventions. Uh, so you know enough, enough now to be dangerous, I would say. Um, and I often find it very useful to look at, rather than just looking at raw assembly code, go ahead and look at the assembly code along with the associated C code that produced it. And that'll be fairly clear as to what's going on, especially if you can do a disassembly where you see C, uh, C statement and then assembly instructions. C statement, assembly instructions. Very, fairly clear to see what's going on. So the one last thing to look at is the, how you get from C code to a running program. So the compiler is the GCC compiler, right? And so that takes a .c file to assembly language. Um, then, so you don't normally see this. If you run the GCC command by itself and just say, for instance, GCC foo.c, it's going to go ahead and automatically create an assembly file, create an object file, create a executable from that. But what it's doing under the covers is actually first executing the GCC uh, uh, command to compile the code to assembly language. And then there's an assembler, which is the GAS, which takes the assembly language file and generates an object file. So an object file contains the uh, machine code for this C file, plus other things like symbols. So, for example, if we have foo.c, and foo.c contains uh, a foo function and a bar function, and then we've got uh, x.c, which contains an x function, and x calls foo, okay? Then what we've got here is a .o file that references foo. And we've got a .o file here that defines foo and bar. So the fact that there are references to foo exist in this .o file as part of the symbol table. Here, the fact that this .o file defines foo and bar, again, is part of the symbol table. As well, we might have debugging information. So there might be debugging information that says this particular uh, machine instruction is line 52 of x.c. 
And this machine instruction, a few down here, that's line 53 and so on. So we can do source level debugging. Also know where all the local variables are and everything else. So those can be embedded in the Dado file as well. But at a minimum, what we have is the compiled code, the machine code. Uh, so the compiled and assembled code. So we have the machine code and we have the necessary symbols, at least a minimal set of symbols, so that we can then link together. So the linker resolves references. Okay, so the linker will actually say, okay, I'm going to take this .o file, wherever there's a call to foo, I'm going to actually replace that with a call to the instruction that is in here where foo starts, because I now have everything together and I can look at it all as I'm linking. The linker is going to complain, for instance, if you have an undefined function. So if there's some call that's made in one of these object files and there's no associated definition. The linker also complain if you have no function named main because the default is you have to have a main. So the linker then gives us an a dot out by default. That's the name that's used and that's very historical. And then the loader is used to actually load into memory. You are going to be writing a loader. A loader uh, includes things like oh, where to load into memory. Uh, the loader initializes global variables and then reads in all the code and puts it into memory. Okay. So compiler compiles the code to assembly. Assembly assembles the code into uh, an object code. Then the linker combines object files into a single executable and the loader loads it in memory. 